Harry's Wife, Part 68.1 Jubilee Uninvited This series is naturally about Harry's wife because she is a prominent example of narcissism in action. This series has been used to enable you to understand the dynamic between Harry's wife and other people, Prince Harry, the Queen, other members of the royal family, her own family, members of the public, her supporters, her detractors, so that you understand how narcissism functions, how the narcissist sees the world, how the narcissist manipulates, and provides a working example of narcissism in action. Naturally, because of her need to remain relevant, asserting control and drawing fuel, and the other aspects of the prime aims, both in person and through the press, she truly is the gift that keeps on giving. And many of you have commented to me that you find it extremely useful to learn about narcissism and understand it by having a working example and a prominent one at that. Many people have also contacted me to explain that they didn't understand anything about narcissism until they happened upon this series, and it has switched on a light for them, not only with regard to understanding narcissism more generally, but more importantly, to recognising that it was impacting upon their own private lives. Harry's wife repeatedly gives us opportunity for analysis and to showcase different aspects of the dynamic, different forms of interaction, different types of manipulation, different types of reaction. However, for a moment, we're going to take the spotlight away from Harry's wife, accordingly, wounding her and focusing a little on Her Majesty the Queen, Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth was born on the 21st of April 1926 and is Queen of the United Kingdom and 15 other Commonwealth realms. When her father died in February 1952, Elizabeth, then 25 years old, became head of the Commonwealth and Queen Regnant of seven independent Commonwealth countries, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Pakistan and Ceylon. She has reigned as a constitutional monarch through major political changes, such as devolution in the United Kingdom, accession of the United Kingdom to the European communities, Brexit, Canadian patriation and the decolonisation of Africa. Significant events have included her coronation in 1953 and the celebration of her silver, golden and diamond jubilees in 1977, 2002 and 2012 respectively. In 2017, she became the first British monarch to reach a sapphire jubilee. In 2021, after 73 years of marriage, her husband Prince Philip died at the age of 99. Elizabeth is the longest lived and longest reigning British monarch, the longest serving female head of state in world history, the world's oldest living monarch, longest reigning current monarch, and oldest and longest serving current head of state. She has undertaken tens of thousands of official public engagements and has given a life to service. Yes, she has privilege, of course, and amongst all of that has dedicated her life to service as she set out when she may first made that address back in South Africa all those years ago. By way of example, in 2019, at the age of 93 years old, she undertook 295 official engagements. She wasn't skulking away in some mansion in Montesquieu. She wasn't issuing dick tags for press releases. She wasn't engaged in the systematic sustained devaluation of her spouse. She is one of the hardest working royals, only outshone in that regard by her daughter, Princess Anne, and has been on the throne for almost 70 years. And of course, next year, it is Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee, taking place in 2022. There will be year-long Platinum Jubilee celebrations throughout the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and around the world as communities come together to celebrate her historic reign. This, of course, provides her with 
an excellent opportunity. In 2022, the Queen will become the first British monarch to celebrate a Platinum Jubilee, 70 years of service. Throughout the year, Her Majesty and members of the Royal Family will travel around the country to undertake a variety of engagements to mark the historic occasion, culminating with the focal point of the Platinum Jubilee weekend in June. This will be an extended bank holiday from Thursday 2nd to Sunday 5th of June and will provide an opportunity for communities and people throughout the United Kingdom to come together to celebrate the historic milestone. The four days of celebrations will include public events and community activities, as well as national moments of reflection on the Queen's 70 years of service. The Thursday 2nd of June will see the Queen's birthday parade with Trooping the Colour, with over 1,400 parading soldiers, 200 horses and 400 musicians who will come together in a traditional parade to mark the Queen's official birthday. There will be the Platinum Jubilee Beacons, the United Kingdom's long tradition of celebrating Royal Jubilee's weddings and coronations, with the lighting of beacons will be continued to mark the Platinum Jubilee. Beacons will be lit throughout the United Kingdom, Channel Islands, Isle of Man and UK overseas territories. For the first time, beacons will also be lit in each of the capital cities of the Commonwealth countries to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. On Friday the 3rd of June, a service of Thanksgiving will take place at St Paul's Cathedral. On Saturday the 4th of June, Her Majesty the Queen, accompanied by members of the Royal Family, will attend the Derby at Epsom Downs. And there'll be the Platinum Party at the Palace. The British Broadcasting Corporation will stage and broadcast a special live concert from Buckingham Palace that will bring together some of the world's biggest entertainment stars to celebrate the most significant and joyous moments from the Queen's seven-decade reign. Sunday the 5th of June will be the Big Jubilee Lunch. People are invited to share friendship, food and fun with neighbours as part of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. A Big Jubilee Lunch can be big or small, street party or picnic, tea and cake or garden barbecue. The Big Lunch provides tips and ideas for hosting an event. There will also be the Platinum Jubilee Pageant, a pageant featuring over 5,000 people from across the United Kingdom, and the Commonwealth will take place against the backdrop of Buckingham Palace and the surrounding streets. It will combine street arts, theatre, music, circus, carnival and costume, and celebrate the service of Her Majesty's reign. A pretty big event. It's a formidable achievement that the Queen has achieved in terms of this life of service of 70 years and the Queen will be well advised to use this momentum occasion to uninvite Harry's wife and Harry from the Jubilee celebrations. After all, it's her party and she can have there who she wants. Save the shuggers, nobody would actually criticise such a move were she to do so. First of all, It would enable her to issue a clear signal of disapproval of the behaviour of Harry's wife and Harry. The Queen has maintained a largely dignified silence, repeating the message that they are much-loved members of the royal family, not lowering herself to meet the allegations and smears head-on, which, of course, is something that all of you should learn from when dealing with a narcissist. Where you are smeared, whilst the things that might be said about you are untrue or true to an extent, invariably it causes a reaction from you to want to counter the smear. You don't like the fact that the narcissist is spreading untruths about you. That's understandable. But in so doing, when you fight against it, either directly by confronting the narcissist or indirectly by trying to counter the smear, by talking to other people to point out that the narcissist is wrong, you end up only causing the narcissist to fight harder against you because your response threatens the narcissist's control. It's far more effective, although difficult to do, to ignore the smear. Save where the smearing impacts upon your livelihood or income or reputation, where perhaps formal legal action might need to be taken. But if it amounts to little more than tittle-tattle and gossip, whilst you are tempted to want to set the record straight, you are much better served in not doing so. By failing to respond, you wound the narcissist. By failing to respond, you reduce the risk of the narcissist having to assert control further over you, because you will come off the radar. By failing to respond, you make it less likely that the narcissist will continue to hoover or smear you on another occasion. 
and the Queen, by adopting a largely dignified silence so far, is an effective response to dealing with Harry's wife. She has given Harry's wife and Harry opportunity after opportunity to behave themselves, for want of a better expression. And as we have seen through various parts of these series, it doesn't happen. And thus, they dig themselves deeper and deeper with regard to the continuing disapproval of all, save the Shuggers, who were blinded by their own inability to understand evidence. And consequently, more and more people recognise the behaviours are wrong, unnecessary, and in some instances viewed as downright repugnant. The Queen remains an approval rating of 85%, according to a YouGov publication just recently. And she is held in the highest regard by many people, not only in the United Kingdom, but around the globe. Even those who don't necessarily see her as directly relevant to their daily lives can only recognise and respect the amount of public service that she has undertaken. After all, imagine how dull it must be going to factory after factory to certain events and asking, have you travelled far? And what is it that you do? But she does so without complaint because she recognises that that is her obligation and duty. There's no song and dance unlike somebody else. There is, of course, the publication of the event, but it isn't done to assert control because the Queen is not a narcissist. There is the record of what she has done because people are interested, but she doesn't issue the diktat to ensure that she's noticed. She gets on with it, and if it happens to be reported, then so be it. She doesn't tip off the reporters. She doesn't issue the repeated PR releases in order to ensure that people are there to record her attendance. She goes, people know about it in order to turn up and support her, or not turn up if they choose not to do so. But by uninviting Harry and Harry's wife, this would signal a clear disapproval of their behaviours, which is long overdue. The second impact of doing so but it might actually jolt Harry out of the rut that he finds himself in. Of course, it's not guaranteed, but mired in his emotional thinking and very much in the grip of the manipulations that his wife is deploying against him, he's unable to see that his behaviour is upsetting to the Queen, other members of his family, is not based upon rational responses, and is hurtful. The fact that he might be uninvited to this major event, might just be the jolt that would cause him to come to his senses. Hang on, why has Grandma not invited me or uninvited me? At first, of course, he might well think that there's another blow against him based upon prejudice, but it may just cause him to come to his senses and realise that whilst the eyes of much of the world would be focused on Grandma and her event, he hasn't been invited to the party. And it may well cause him, because he is capable of this self-reflection, to realise, actually, this is because of what I've been doing. And it might just be the slap about the face with the cold cod of logic that he requires to jolt him out of it and quite possibly sow the seeds of realisation and escape. Of course, being uninvited would wound Harry's wife. We hate not being involved. As I've explained in an alternative video, love me, hate me, but never ignore me. You must always respond to us. You must always say hello. You must always ask after us. You must respond to what we say and what we do. And you must not invite us. And you must not uninvite us. And you must always invite us to events. Because we matter. We are important. And if you do not do so, that is a complete slight to us. And it wounds. The fact of being uninvited to a milestone event of these Platinum Jubilee celebrations, where much of the eyes of the world will be on the Queen and the United Kingdom, and not being a part of it, would cause massive wounding to Harry's wife. That in itself, should Her Majesty be aware of the effect of it, provide a huge amount of private satisfaction. She doesn't have to see the response to it, she doesn't have to see the tantrum at Monte Shitcho when news of the uninvitation occurs. Of course, blame will be thrown at Harry, at the assistance, at anybody but herself. 
Her reaction, should she be uninvited, would be that it would threaten her sense of control. It would cause huge wounding. Her fuel levels would plummet. The fury would ignite in an attempt to defend her. She would feel the presence of the chasm, but not know what it actually is. The calling of the creature, the reminder of her weakness, how she is really nothing, her vapid, vacuous self coming to the fore. Although she won't actually recognise it, she'll experience that crushing sensation of impending oblivion. A sense of failure. The sense of doom. The emptiness coming to swallow her. And her narcissism will fight and fight hard to save her from that oblivion by the ignition of her fury, causing her to lash out left, right and centre to blame people. But the wounding would still be done. Uninviting them would also ensure that Harry's wife doesn't try and make a song and dance prior to the Platinum Jubilee. As I have explained elsewhere, that when anything is about you, your wedding, your birthday, somebody else's achievement, somebody else's promotion, somebody else's song, somebody else's buck, we are envious of your contentment and your achievements. In some instances, because of facade management, we will appear to be pleased for you and supportive and praise you, but that's only a further form of manipulation. But for most times, anything that you do, anything related to you, when it's outside of the golden period, we are envious of it. And this causes us to want to try and spoil it, to pull the attention back onto us. So when it's somebody's funeral, the narcissist turns up with a wailing and gnashing of teeth, making out that, oh, poor dear Uncle Teddy, how I miss him. You've not seen him in 30 years, but now you come crawling out of the woodwork, the, de the Death Watch beetle, click-clacking those heels across the stones of the church and wailing about how much you've missed him. Of course, that unaware narcissist believes that they've missed Uncle Teddy. The evidence proves that they could not have done because they've had nothing to do with him for 30 years. But in the moment, because it's about somebody else, the narcissism has to make it about the narcissist and causes them to believe that they are the one that is upset that they are the one that is distraught, that they are the one that is hurt, so that they cry and wail and go on about how much they miss Uncle Teddy, so it provokes a response from people, thus enabling the assertion of control and the drawing of fuel. Similarly, with this event looming, Harry's wife would go into overdrive, because it being all about the Queen, it takes attention away from her. There would be an overdrive of PR announcements. There would be the doing the hokey-cokey in terms of whether she would attend or not. And of course, in all likelihood, because attendance would be problematic for her, not just because of her plummeting levels of popularity, but also the fact because all lies will be elsewhere, it's likely that her narcissist will try and guide her to not turn up, that she would assert control by withdrawal. Of course, that would create certain facade difficulties, and therefore it would be necessary to set forth with a plethora of excuses as to why she could not come. But in the weeks and months prior to the Platinum Jubilee year and the main event in June, it is likely that Harry's wife would ensure that it was all about her through the press, to ensure that she's the one that's spoken about, to try and take the limelight away from the Queen. Shameless behaviour, but of course, this is what the narcissist does. And therefore, by uninviting well in advance, such a song and dance could be removed. The ability to assert control would be stripped from Harry's wife because her song and dance routine would be entirely redundant. Ultimately, not inviting the gruesome twosome would amount to righteous retribution on behalf of the Queen. And of course, the advantage is, is that it's not a breach of no contact. By uninviting her, it would mean that she has nothing to do with her and therefore would be a viable part of a no-contact regime. Because, dear listeners, as you know, the principle of GOSO applies, the first golden rule of freedom, that when you know that you're dealing with a narcissist, you get out and you stay out. You go so. And an uninvent and uninviting Harry's wife from the Platinum Jubilee celebrations would indeed amount to the application of GOSO. So it would be a complete win for Her Majesty, she would be implementing a near total no contact regime. She would be issuing a clear signal of disapproval for the conduct of the gruesome twosome's behaviour. It might just jolt Harry into realisation and start the process 
of him potentially escaping. It would certainly wound Harry's wife, with all that ensues from that as I have described, and it would also nullify the attempts by Harry's wife to make it all about her in the run-up to it. Your Majesty, if you happen to be listening, an invitation is the way forward. Uninvite them both, and deliver the blow that I have just described. You know it makes sense. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.